Hey everyone, I wanna welcome you to this episode of Just Teach. This is episode two, and today's lesson is entitled Ambassadors for Christ. That's right, we've been given the honor of serving as representatives for the kingdom of heaven. Now we know this position comes with some responsibility, but it certainly comes with many privileges and blessings as well. Listen, I'm excited about today's lesson. Let's see what God has for us. Our lesson today comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse number 11, and then it's going to conclude at verse number 21. We're going to start off at verse number 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. So there's a saying, um, and it's somewhat cliche, uh, and it's kind of a joke, if you will, but it says that any time you see the word therefore in scripture, you should take a moment and see what it's there for. So when Paul is saying in verse number 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, he's referring to something and he's actually referring to verse number 10. Now, if you recall in our previous lesson, in verse 10, we talked about how all of humanity, everybody that lives, has to stand at some point before the judgment seat of Christ. And when you stand before Christ, God is going to judge your works, whether they be good and whether they be bad. So since everybody is going to be judged, Paul is saying, we persuade men. Persuade them of what? Persuade them to be ready. Paul is, is, is adamant, he's, he's very intense, he's, he's very passionate, that's what it is. He's passionate about making sure that everybody is aware that when you leave this life, there is a judgment that comes after that. There is a judgment that everybody must go through when they stand before God. So he's saying that like this, this is this is my driving force. This is my energy. This is what this is what's motivating me to do ministry because I'm persuading men so that they can be ready. And you know that's so important. That's important why? Because that's exactly where Jesus' ministry left off. If you recall back in the book of Matthew, in Matthew 24, when Jesus was nearing the end of his ministry, he was teaching in parables and all he was telling people, he was telling people, you need to be ready when I come back. No man knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man returns. So he was teaching in parables and he taught about the 10 version, five foolish and five wise and how five were ready to go in the wedding feast and five didn't have their oil prepared. And he talked about the parable of, of the talents. He talked about the three servants, how one was given five talents, one was given two, one was given one, and the one with the one talent buried the talent in the ground. And when the master came back, he didn't have anything to present to the master. And he was telling them that you need to be ready when Jesus comes. That was the idea of these parables. He was trying to prepare people to let them know you need to be ready for my return. Well, that's exactly what Paul is doing. That's what he's saying is the motivation of his ministry. He is trying to persuade men to let them know that you need to be ready. But there's an important element to this. And that important element is, is that knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. See, this is a driving force of Paul because he knows that the key to any successful walk with God is a healthy fear of the Lord. Now, see, Paul isn't saying that you have a literal fear of God. Understand this. Fear in this case means that you reverence God. Scripture talks about in Proverbs chapter 1, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. So if you have a reverence for God, if you see God as God, if you see God as a position of authority, if you see him as somebody who is to be respected, then that's one step closer to you understanding the word of God, understanding who God is and what his expectations of you uh, are of you. Now, on one end, yes, we know God is a loving God. He's a merciful God. He's a gracious God. But then Hebrew tells us that he's also a consuming fire. So we have to know that God is one to be feared. We have to know that he's one to be reverenced. We have to know that he, he has terror and that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is a challenging, this is a challenging verse right here because I'm going to be honest with you. If you look at a lot of the churches out today, we don't hear the message of the fear of the Lord being preached really as often as we should. 
in a lot of the churches, particularly in this westernized American type of, of church world, what we have is we have a lot of what they call prosperity preaching. It's a lot of preaching that's focused on money. It's a lot of preaching that's fo focused on, you know, just what you can receive from God versus what you can give to God. And a lot of times it will leave people with the, in with the impression that God doesn't have any expectations of us. And that couldn't be further from the truth. God certainly has expectations of every believer, but that understanding of expectations comes with the fear of the Lord. There's a scripture in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. It says, it says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. So mercy and truth come from God. We are purged from iniquity by a gift from God. He's giving us mercy and truth. But then it goes on to say, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So how do you depart from evil? How do you change your lifestyle? How do you become a new person in Christ? Well, it comes from the standpoint that you fear God. If you fear God and understand that he has expectations of you and you're going to stand before him one day and he's going to judge your works, it compels you to walk in righteousness. So then Paul goes on to say, he says, but we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest to your conscience. All Paul is saying right here is that he has a sincere ministry. He's saying that he's saying that we're made manifest to God, which we can't hide anything from God. God knows that we're sincere. And he's saying, I hope you know that we're sincere too. Paul is doing a little bit of defense right here of his ministry because his ministry is coming under a lot of tack in the city of Corinth. Now, we're going to get into some more details about that later on in the message. But Paul is kind of letting the groundwork right here in verse number 11 when he's talking about being made manifest both to God and to them. Let's look at verse number 12. Verse 12 reads, For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. So when you look at verse 12 and we look at the word commend, when you, when you commend something, it is by means of introduction. It is for the purpose of introducing two parties and bringing them together. So when Paul is saying, uh, for we commend not ourselves, in other words, Paul is saying, look, we're not trying to prove ourselves to you. Paul's not coming with big titles. He's not coming with big degrees, you know, calling himself apostle, doctor of the second, third prelate of this, that, and the other. No, he's not trying to, to uh, peacock, if you will, and trying to prove that he's some accomplished person in ministry. He's saying for the very reason that you guys already know who I am. You know, at this point, Paul is writing 2 Corinthians. And we know that 2 Corinthians isn't necessarily the second letter. It could have been the fourth letter. He, he'd written multiple letters at this point. He had had multiple visits to the city of Corinth, to the church of Corinth. They're very well versed and know who he is. But again, Paul is, is having to uh, reupholster his ministry a little bit. He's, he's having to, to defend himself. Again, we mentioned uh, before that Paul's ministry was coming under just a bit of attack. And understand, why, why are we seeing that? In, in verse 12, it also says that uh, there are those that, uh, that are caught up in appearance. He says that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance. Now, he's, he's doing two things here. He's talking about two different types of parties here. On one end, he's talking about Jews. Now, understand, uh, Paul was once a Jew himself. Paul was once one who persecuted Christians. But now he's somebody, he's a Judeo-Christian who has converted from the Jewish faith to the Christian faith. And you best believe that there are some people of the Jewish faith that don't appreciate that. You know, if, if you go back to 1 Corinthians, it talks about how when Paul came to Corinth to establish the church of Corinth, initially Paul was preaching in the temple, the, the Jewish temple in Corinth. They got mad and kicked him out. So then he went right next door and planted a church at somebody's house right next to the Jewish temple. That's how bold he was. And that's the and that's how uh, it kind of created a lot of tension between him and the local Jews there. So we have Jews who uh, by, by religious practice were very caught up in the outward. They were caught up in things like circumcision. 
They were caught up in uh, Jewish tradition. And they were saying that if you don't keep Jewish tradition, they were caught up in outward appearances. They were saying, they were trying to discredit Paul's ministry and saying, surely this this can't really be the, the, the man of God that he claims to be. So on one end, Paul is being attacked by, 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 uh, by Jews. But you have to understand, there's, there's another application to this people being caught up in appearances. Why? Because Paul is also ministering in a Greek city. Now, Greek uh, and Corinth was a major metropolitan city, which means there was lots of money there. There was lots of commerce there. So it, it you know, when you can't compare it or maybe even look at it like uh, modern day America, people were caught up in wearing nice shoes, wearing nice clothes, driving fancy cars. It was very much driven by aesthetics. And if you take a step back and be honest, some of our churches are like that today. Some of what we see going on throughout the church world is we're seeing uh, picking up American culture and we attribute gain to godliness. The bigger the church, the more godly you are. The more people you have, the more godly you are. If you drive a plane or have a fancy car, the more we, we attribute gain to godliness. And sometimes we, 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 our heart is turned away from authentic ministry. And that's what Paul is struggling with right here. He, he's, he's having to deal with Jews and he's having to deal with the Greek culture. He's having to deal with people who are looking at his ministry and saying, who, who is this guy, Paul? He, he looks kind of crazy. He looks kind of radical. And, and, and he's having to defend himself in a sense, but he's telling them that I don't need to prove myself to you. You, you know who I am. And he says, as a matter of fact, I'm giving you occasion to glory. Paul is saying, I'm giving you an opportunity to defend me. Now that's, that's, that's saying something right there. That's saying, Paul is saying, look, I, you, you know who I am and you shouldn't sit back and let people talk bad about me. That's what a real friend does. That's, that's, that's what a real saint does. If you, if you got people who have a bad understanding of people that you know in ministry, who you know are godly, who are loving God and doing a work for him, you, you don't sit back and let people just talk crazy about people. You give them occasion to glory. You say, hold on. I'm familiar with that person's ministry. They love God. They're on fire for God. And that's what Paul is hoping and expecting the, uh, the people at Corinth to do. He's saying, I'm giving you occasion to glory. I'm giving you an opportunity to defend me. Listen, this is getting good. Let's go to verse number 13. Verse 13 says, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. So in verse 13, when Paul is talking about uh, being beside ourselves or being sober, he's not necessarily talking about being drunk versus being sober, but he's actually talking about the fact that he was so radical, the fact that he was so on fire for God, he was so bold that sometimes people look at Paul's ministry and they'd be like, Paul, you're, you're a little bit crazy. And, and, and that is very characteristic of Paul's ministry. You know, if you look at Paul's ministry, particularly throughout the book of Acts, Paul, uh, Paul had a very confrontational ministry. He had a very upfront, in-your-face kind of ministry. Paul was frequently getting arrested. He was frequently getting beaten. He was frequently, uh, frequently getting in confrontations with people of local authority, not because he was necessarily trying to be rebellious, but, but simply because he was preaching the gospel. And that, that gained influence, and sometimes that rubbed certain people the wrong way. So Paul was known as somebody who was really, really on fire for God. You know, and again, if you read through in the book of Acts, I mean, on one occasion, Paul was on his way to the city of Jerusalem to preach. And, and, a, and a, a prophet came to him and told him, if you go to the city of Jerusalem, you're going to get arrested. And everybody that was in Paul's camp, they looked at Paul and they were like, um, Paul, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't go to Jerusalem. You know, maybe we should just fall back on this one. But Paul was so adamant. Paul was so on fire. He said, I know what God has told me to do. And I'm going to go forward with what God has spoken to me. I'm going to Jerusalem. And guess what? He most definitely got arrested. <laughs> and that's how on fire he was. That's how, that's how bold he was. And, you know, and we know that, that that arrest eventually led to him being martyred. But even when he was in the presence of King Agrippa, you know, if you read in Acts chapter 26, 
Paul went in this big discourse, you know, explaining, you know, how he had an encounter with God on the road to Damascus, and he was just defending his ministry and talking about how Christ is the is the true Messiah and all these things. And, and at one point, there was a governor there by the name of Festus, and they said, he said, Paul, surely all your learning has made you mad. That that's that's what they're saying because Paul was so at Paul Paul had been arrested for preaching the gospel. And now he's standing in front of a king, in front of a governor being tried for preaching the gospel. And what does he do? He starts preaching the gospel. <laughs> That's how on fire he was. So when people look at Paul and they say, Paul, you know, you, you're a little bit cuckoo. He says there's a reason for it. He's saying, I'm just doing this for your cause, you know, and I think that that's so that's that's something special that we can kind of take from a page from Paul's book right there is that the reality is, is that when you really love God, sometimes people will see you as radical. Sometimes people will see you as a quote unquote Jesus freak. You know, if you look back in the book of Acts, you know, uh, boldness is a characteristic of the Holy Spirit. That, that is a characteristic uh, uh, of uh, an attribute of the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. You know, it talks about in Acts chapter 4 that after Peter and John had been arrested, uh, uh, um, that they went back to the upper room and they prayed. And scripture says that they got baptized with the Holy Ghost all over again and that they were filled with boldness. So boldness is, it is a, a characteristic and an attribute of the spirit. And sometimes that just comes with the territory, but that's okay. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we don't exercise discretion. It doesn't mean that we intentionally become confrontational, but it does mean that sometimes people will see our love for Christ as radical. There's one other thing I want to point out about this, and that's the fact, you know, Paul was radical as a Jew. He was very well known for persecuting Christians. He was known for killing Christians. He was, he was known for being such a Pharisee that when people got up with this heretical doctrine talking about a Messiah named Jesus, he was, he was first in line. He, he was there at, when, when Nathan was martyred. He was there casting stones, killing him. But Paul, after at, at that time, Saul being converted to Paul, he was just as radical as a Christian as he was a Jew. Why am I talking about this? I'm telling you that a lot of times God will take who you were before you got saved and use some of those same attributes, use some of those same strengths to do ministry. You know, if you were a talker when you were in the world and you were the person that was always running your mouth, it's, it's not surprising that when you get saved, you become a preacher. Why? Because God will use that same strength that you had in the world. He'll use it when you come to him. You know, and it's interesting to say that a lot of times people don't have a problem with you when you're in the world. People don't have a problem with you before you come to Christ. They don't have a problem when you were, when you were drunk, when, when you were on drugs. They didn't have a problem with you when you were sleeping around and doing all other kind of things. But as soon as you give your life to Christ and as soon as you become on fire for God, that's when people start to look at you strange. And that's unfortunate because the truth of the matter is Paul was radical before he got saved. He was, he was radical as a Jew, but when he became a radical as a Christian, that's when they started saying things like, you must be a madman. No, but he wasn't a madman. He just loved the Lord. Let's go to verse number 14. Verse 14 says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. So when we look at the word constrained, you know, the word constrained, it, it has several applications in scripture. So when we look at verse number 14, the, the, the particular application means, it means to urge. It, it, it means to compel. And it's a particular urge that is, it is an inner urge. It, it means pulling on the soul. It means to compel from within when he's saying that the love of Christ constrains us. And if you look at the literal translation of the word constrain, it means to compress on all sides. So when Paul is saying, it's almost like, like having, having a straight jacket on. You're, you're just compressed but by, by all sides. So when Paul is saying that the love of Christ constrains me, he's saying that I, I can't move. I, can't, I can only do what the love of Christ will allow me to do. So if I try to raise my hand, I can't raise my hand. 
because the love of Christ constrains me. If I want to try to go go here or do this, I can only do what the love of Christ will const- will allow me to do because I'm being pressed on all sides. That's what Paul is talking about right here. Now, some people might look at that and may, they may think it's strange because scripture says <laughs> where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, right? There's freedom. So how do you interpret freedom by being constrained? Understand this. Paul talked about in Romans chapter six, he says that when we were in sin, we were servants of sin or slaves of sin. So he says, now that you've been set free, you are now servants of righteousness. So you are set free to be a slave. Now that's a blessing. I I know what it sounds like. I know what it sounds like, but that's a blessing because understand this. If the love of Christ constrains you, you have to understand that the love of Christ is all around you. That means the love of Christ is protecting you and it's also keeping you. So then even when you would want to go do something that maybe would be harmful to you, the love of Christ is constraining you. Maybe when you might get into a relationship that might break your heart, it's the love of Christ that's giving you the wisdom to to just be patient and wait on what God has for you. When when, when you might might want to go and take on a job or, or just do something that is not according to the plan and the purpose that God has for you, it's the love of Christ that's constraining you and it's keeping you. And yeah, you can't do everything that everybody else is doing. And and maybe maybe there are some maybe there are some spiritual guidelines. That are governing your life, but it's not hurting your life. It's actually keeping you from things that might hurt you somewhere down the road. So he's saying that the love of Christ constrains him, but understand this, when he's talking about this, he's saying it not only protects him, but it also sets him on a path. Because he says that if we thus judge that if one died for all, then everybody was dead. See, the the Bible says uh, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So everybody is in need of deliverance. Everybody is in need of salvation. And he's saying, uh, just like it talks about in Romans chapter 5, I'm trying to recall the verse, but it talks about how that through one man came sin and through sin came death and that same likeness through one man came salvation. If one man brought sin, then one man is bringing deliverance. One man is bringing salvation. So that's what Paul is saying right here. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we know everybody everybody is in need of salvation. That's really what makes the book of Romans just really so profound. If you go back and read that in chapter one, Paul is making uh, an, an accusation against the Gentiles and then goes to Romans chapter two and makes an accusation against the Jews and then goes to chapter three and says, since I already laid out the groundwork, I want to let you know that the end conclusion of it all is that none are righteous. Everybody needs salvation. Everybody needs deliverance because one died for all, then indeed all were dead. Let's look at verse 15. Verse 15 says, And he that died for all, that they which live, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So verse 15 says something kind of interesting. It says those that live should not live unto themselves. It's it's not a guarantee. It's it's, it's our choice. God doesn't force us to do anything. But Paul is saying the logical conclusion here is that if somebody died for you, you should be willing to live for them. You, you should, the proper response to their sacrifice is that you should be willing to live on their behalf. Now, my concern with verse 15 is that in our culture, I'm not sure that we understand sacrifice. I'm not sure that we really appreciate sacrifice. You know, we live in a contemporary culture that's full of a lot of entitlement. We, we, we have a lot of people that just feel like maybe life owes them something, you know. And when somebody makes a great sacrifice, sometimes sacrifices go unappreciated. I know some parents out there are saying, amen, because <laughs> you've made some sacrifices for your kids. And sometimes you're like, do they appreciate these sacrifices that I'm making for them, you know? And uh, so in order for us to really embrace verse 15, 
You've got to appreciate sacrifice. You've got to appreciate the concept and you have to understand what a sacrifice it was for Jesus to come down from heaven, God in the form of flesh. Scripture says in uh, Philippians chapter number two, it says that he thought it not robbery to be counted among us, took on the form of a slave, a servant. He took on flesh and we understand that that was a sacrifice. He was in heavenly places. He was sitting in, in, in a kingdom position. You know, if you look back when, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, it's kind of interesting to know that the devil tempted Jesus with the kingdom. Now, you know, the devil knows how to push our buttons. The devil doesn't tempt us with random things. He tempts us with things that are close to our flesh. So we already know from that temptation alone, Jesus knew that, 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 that his desire was to be a king. His, his, his desire and his under who he was in heavenly places was a king. And he understood that that was just the enemy trying to tempt him. So we know that it was a sacrifice for him to come down from his heavenly kingdom to be counted among us. But then he didn't just do that. He died, paid a price for us, that we could not, that it was a sacrifice. In, in order for verse number 15 to really move you, you really have to appreciate the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. You know, and that's something that, that, that we all really have to take inventory. We really have to look back and just, just kind of consider for a moment, what could I be doing? What, what, what should I be doing? What, what work did Jesus leave off with that I should pick up? because I'm, I'm being appreciative of the sacrifice. Now listen, if you understand sacrifice and you understand verse 15, you're, you're, you're one step closer to the responsibility of being an ambassador for Christ. Now look, we're get, verse 20 is coming. <laughs> it's coming, make, make no mistake, it, it is coming. We're gonna break down ambassador, but verse 15 is kind of like, uh, it's just the appetizer, we're, we're getting there. Let's get to verse 16. Verse 16 says, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. So when Paul is saying that we don't know anyone after the flesh anymore, it's, it's a very literal interpretation there. He's saying we don't use flesh as, as a guide anymore for our understanding of people. We look at people through the lens of Christ. We look at them in the spirit. We look at them as who they are in God right now. And I think that that's very important. That means that we don't use the, you know, the, the, the natural schools of thought, you know, in order to, I guess, interact with people, understand the world around us in order to approach ministry. We, we, don't, we don't use that. Scripture says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. And I think it's important what Paul is saying right here because a lot of times you can see people going through things in the natural. And if you don't have a spiritual lens, you won't know what's going on with them. You know, uh, if, if you look at some of the miracles that Jesus performed when you had legion, you know, that, that was in the grave or you had, you had the, the, the little boy who had the lunatic spirit, you know, that was casting himself in the fire and, and they, they brought him to the disciples and the disciples couldn't do anything about it. You know, if you look at them through a natural lens, you would just say they're psychologically disturbed. You would say they're mental disturbed, or you see, you would say that they, they, they have some mental health issue going on. But if you look at them in the spirit, you know, well, they're demon possessed. There, there's a demon on the inside of them that's causing them to do that. And see, when you say that we know no man after the flesh, that means that you're looking at everything in life through a spiritual lens. But then there's another side to this. Because what we're talking about is that when you have given your life to Christ, we're also looking at that through a spiritual lens. Now, that's the blessing. Jesus said in, in the book of Matthew, I believe, he said that anybody who does the will of the Father, that person is my brother and sister. So he's saying, in other words, I, I'm, I'm letting go of all these natural ties. You know, I, I don't mean regardless of who my, my father is, regardless of who my mother is, regardless of who my brother, my, my brothers and sisters are the children of the kingdom. Amen. You know, uh, I believe Paul talked about it in Philippians chapter two. He says, I count all things as dung for the excellency of Christ. 
You know, Paul was a very accomplished man in the natural. He was very educated. He was he had a very high social status in life. You know, one thing that's not really talked about a lot about Paul is that he was a Roman citizen, which means he had Roman status. And that, that, that probably alludes to the fact that he was a Pharisee that probably served on the Sanhedrin court for the fact that he had Roman status. So Paul gave up a lot of things to convert from Judaism to Christianity. And Paul says, look, I know I gave up a lot to get saved. I know I gave up a lot to come to Christ, but you know what? He said, I count it all as dung because what God has given me is so much better than what I lost in the natural. And see, that's the posture that we have to take as believers today. We have to look at verse number 16 and say, we don't know anyone after the flesh. I don't even know myself after the flesh. Who I was before I came to God doesn't matter. It could have been bad. It could have been good. I could have been high. I could have been low. It doesn't matter what it is. All I'm looking for now is I'm looking for the spirit of the matter. I'm looking at life through the lens of Christ. He's saying that if Christ died, that there was a death that took place and that if we acknowledge the death of Christ, then who we are, that died too. I don't need to know anybody after the flesh. I'm not going to hold anybody in contempt for who they were before they got saved. I don't I don't know anybody after the flesh. And you know, sometimes that that can be a struggle for certain people because maybe you had a reputation that was out there. Maybe maybe people thought certain things about you before you came to God. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter now. It's all in the sea of forgetfulness. Amen. So we're getting to verse number 17 and we know that that's going to bless us. Verse 17 reads, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All right. So looking at verse number 17, we've got the word therefore again. And what did we say earlier? If it's word therefore, we need to see what it's there for. And a lot of times it's just referring to the previous verse. So in verse 17, it's referring back to verse 16 to saying that we don't know any man after the flesh. Why? Because in verse 17 says that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature or he is a new creation. Everything that was old about them has passed away. Just as Jesus died, their old life, their old life died as well. Now this... <laughs> This is probably one of the most profound scriptures, verses in all of scripture. You know, honestly, chapter 5 of, of 2 Corinthians, I would probably say, is one of Paul's greatest writings next to the book of Romans. It just really gives us a lens onto what the real Christian experience is all about. Because look at this. When you talk about new, okay, the word new in scripture appears in two different forms, okay? There's two different Greek words that translate to the word new, all right? One of the words new, it means new in time. It, it, it means it's unprecedented. That means that it, it's new, it didn't exist before this point, all right? But then there's a second word that translates to new, and that's the word that we have right here in verse 17. It's talking about an improvement or a change in quality. It, it, it means it's, it's a, it's, it is a change in substance. It is, it is new. You know what's interesting about something being new is that it doesn't even necessarily have to be fancy in order for it to be nice. You know, you look at a lot of cars today, a, a new car doesn't have to be luxurious in order for it to be nice. Anything that is new, that's got a condition of being new, that has a quality of being new, it is already synonymous with something that is that is pleasant to engage. So what he's saying is that when you come in Christ, the substance of who you are is brand new, but he takes it a step further than that. So you've got to understand that when you come to Christ, sometimes people's thinking is that God, uh, he, he regenerates you, you know, or, or he uh, does some type of makeover, you know, when, when he, he restores you back to the previous version of yourself before sin entered your life. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Understand this, when God makes you a new creation, that means that who you are now in Christ never existed in creation. 
That means that creation has never seen a person like you now. Creation has never seen this version of you. That means that, that when you came to Christ, God had to go all the way back to Genesis chapter number one, where it says, and God created the heavens and the earth. God had to go back and, re and use that same substance where he first created you, when he first created the timeline of your life. And he says, okay, now they're in me. I've got to make them a new creation. You've got to believe that. And I pray that that blesses you. You know why? Because you know sometimes people can be so ashamed of their past. People can feel sometimes that they have to run from their past. Some people feel like they have to live under the cloud of their past. But you know the truth of the matter is that when you came to Christ, he made you all over again. He made you into a person that didn't exist, so you shouldn't worry about people trying to treat you like the old you. As a matter of fact, you should insist that people not treat you like the old you. You know why? Yeah. Hey, don't talk to me like the way you used to talk to me. I'm a new creation. You should have that expectation of yourself that you're a new creation. I'm not going to do the same things that I used to do. I'm not going to go the same places that I used to go. I'm, I'm, I'm a new person and, and my appetite has been stirred. My, my expectations have been peaked. My, my, my interest, I'm looking for God to do new things in my life. And that's amazing. Paul is saying that when you come to Christ, your old life is passed away. Sin no longer has dominion over your life. Now listen, that's, that, that is the key right there. You're a new creature. We talked about it. In Romans chapter 6, before you came to Christ, you were a servant of sin. That word is better translated to slave. You were a slave. You didn't have a choice but to sin. You wanted to stop sinning. Couldn't stop sinning. Why? You were a slave to sin. You know, scripture says that, that, uh, uh, that when we lust, lust, lust brings forth sin. But then it says something really profound. It says, and when sin is finished, Woo! when sin is finished, that means sin has an agenda in your life. Sin wants to do some things with your life. And you know, sometimes people want to try to let go. They want to try to be like, they say, I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop. This is the last time. I'm not going to do it anymore. They say things like they're going to they're gonna stop sleeping with certain people. No, I ain't, I ain't going to do it no more. This, 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 this is the last time. I, I said this was going to be the last time, and this is the last time. And then they find themselves doing it all over again. Why? Because sin isn't finished with you. But when you have given your life to God, you are a new creature. And those bonds... And those strongholds, those ties that sin has on your life, they're broken. You are a new creation and you have a right to expect peace. You have a right to expect strength. You have a right to expect all of those wonderful changes, fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, temperance, long suffering. You have, you have a right to expect all of those things in your life. You should just look at yourself in the mirror and just take, take inventory of the new person that you are because now that Christ died for you and you acknowledged his death, my God. I want to say one last thing about verse number 17 and we're going to move on to verse 18, but it says, therefore, if. Now, I heard a preacher say one time that anytime you see the word if, in a text, that means that there's something that man has to do. It means that God has done all that he can and all that he's supposed to do. Now it's, in, it's, it's on our side of the table. Now it's on us to do something. He's saying, if any man be in Christ, you know what that means? It means that everybody's not in Christ. It means that there, there are qualifications and there are things that you have to do in order to come to Christ. Now, I'm taking the time to, to talk about this, you know, because there are certain teachings out there where people will say, you know, they have doctrines of inclusion and universal salvation. And people want to say things like the finished work of the cross is that everybody is saved. They, they just completely want to throw Romans 10 and 9 out of the picture where Romans, where, where it says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, then we're saved. They, they want to disavow that. 
But Paul is saying something right here. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, he's saying if. It's not a guarantee, but if you've done what's required in order to be in Christ, you're a new creature. You are a new creation. Never see you brand new. You got new car smell on you. Amen. Your old self has passed away and behold, all things have become new. Let's get to verse 18. Verses 18 and 19 say, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Christ Jesus, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not in putting their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You know, when I look at verses uh, 18 and 19, uh, and I see the word reconciliation in there, you know, I, I'm an accountant by profession. So when I hear the word uh, reconcile or reconciliation, it, it does resonate with me a little bit because it, it's a financial term. You know, when you talk about reconciling something or reconciling two things, if, I, if I'm reconciling a balance sheet uh, to maybe a bank statement or something like that, what you're doing is you're identifying the differences. You're trying to figure out what the differences are and you're trying to find out is there some logical uh, uh, steps that can be taken to bring them in alignment with each other. That's what you do when you reconcile something. You bring it into alignment. So we're talking about the fact that we're being reconciled unto God or to saying that Christ reconciled us into himself. What is he saying? He's He brought us into alignment. He identified the differences. He, he identified what separated us. And we all know what that thing was. It was sin that separated us from God. Yeah, we've already talked about it. We said through one man's sin came death. And that's what put a, a separation between us and God. But then scripture goes on to say, in 1 John chapter 2, I believe it's verse 2, where it says that Jesus is our propitiation. Now listen, <laughs> That is a fancy word for saying that he is our mediator or he's the one that stood in the gap. He's the one that 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 uh, that that reconciled. Amen. That that is a, that is a New Testament word for atonement. It, he paid the price. He did what was necessary in order to bring us into proper alignment with himself. Now, it's something completely special. Because who are we trying to get reconciled to? Well, man is trying to get reconciled to God. And who's doing the reconciliation? Who's paying the price? God's paying the price. That's amazing. So God God paid the price for us, and we should have been one paying the debt. We should have been the one paying the price, but he reconciled us to himself. So then in turn, we get a responsibility. Now, we talked about it at the beginning that as ambassadors, we do have a responsibility. And here it is. We talked about how uh, uh, in verse number fifteen that we don't get to li- that we shouldn't live for ourselves. If we if we appreciate the sacrifice, we don't live for ourselves. And now verse nineteen is saying that the way that we don't live for ourselves is that He has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We all in verse number eighteen it says that we have the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? That means that we should go around the world telling other people about the love of Christ. We should do all that we can to bring everybody into proper alignment with God. Just like Paul said in the beginning, in verse number 11, he says he goes around and he urges men. Why? Because he knows the terror of the Lord. So that we, because we appreciate the sacrifice, because we understand that we've been brought into proper alignment with Christ, now we go with our, we, we pick up the ministry of reconciliation, we pick up the word of reconciliation, and we go and we reconcile mankind to God. Let's get to verse 20. Verse 20 says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. There it is. It says, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. So in verse 20, when scripture says that we are ambassadors for Christ, when it says that we are ambassadors, you have to kind of understand a little bit something about uh, the Roman Empire at this point in history. Now, the, the Roman Empire 
was very vast. I mean, it stretched as far west as Western Europe. It stretched as far east as like almost mid Asia, like modern day India, definitely through like Pakistan and all of those countries. It stretched as far south as Northern Africa. It was a very vast empire. So it was cut up in different territories. It was cut up in different providences. And the uh, Roman emperor would assign people over the various providences. Now you have to understand there were two different types of providence that they would have. One was Senate controlled. So the Senate, the government, the, the Roman government would control certain providences, but then other ones were controlled by the emperor. Why? Because there were certain areas that were prone to, uh, to revolting. There were certain uh, territories that were prone to like, you know, rising up in revolt, you know. So in order to kind of control those, the Roman Empire or the Roman Emperor would assign an ambassador over those areas. So that's where Paul is getting his logic from. He's saying that as believers, we are assigned to a providence under God, but the idea is that it's an antagonistic area. It's, it's a problem area. It's, a, it's an area that's prone to revolting and to rising up against the uh, rising up against authority. That's what Paul is saying right here. So we also, so you understand when you're talking about an ambassador. An ambassador pretty much has maybe three characteristics, if you will. Number one, they're in a foreign land that speaks a foreign language. That's one thing. Okay. Then the other thing is, is that the role of an ambassador is to represent the desires of whatever authority they're representing, whatever country they're, they, they, they don't necessarily come with their own agenda. As an, as an ambassador, if you, if, you, if you are an ambassador representing a certain country, if you're an ambassador representing Rome or the Roman emperor, well, then you are there to communicate and facilitate the interests of Rome. And in that same likeness as a believer, if we are ambassadors for Christ, we are here to represent and facilitate the interests of God. Amen. So then the last thing with the, with an ambassador, an ambassador, uh, they operate under the authority of the person that they represent. Now that's, that is, that is important and it's very profound. That means that if you're there to represent the Roman emperor, then you have the authority of the emperor in that particular providence. So we as believers, if we're ambassadors for Christ, we stand, hallelujah, we stand in the authority of Christ. We, we stand in the power of Christ. We have the ability to operate. Now, now, this shouldn't surprise us because scripture talked about it. In John chapter 14, verse number 12, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. But then he goes on to say, And greater works than these shall you do because I go unto my Father. So, so, so Jesus is already laying the groundwork for us to be ambassadors, for us to stand proxy for him, for us to stand in his place. You know, Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I'm the light of the world. But then he, go on, he went on to teach that now we are the light of the world. Why? Because when he was here, he was the light, but now we stand as ambassadors for him. So now we are the light of the world. We are the ones who are going to do greater works than him in, in, in his name. We're, we're going to do the same works that he does also. We're going to stand in the authority of God. You know, that's what's so amazing about this text and telling us that we are ambassadors for Christ. And he said, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. In other words, he's saying that you stand in Christ's stead. We, we, he, he said, we pray that you fulfill the task that, that Christ was trying to fulfill when he was here. And he said, by doing this, we're reconciled to God. Oh my God. It comes full circle. We're reconciled to God by doing what Christ did. We're delivered from sin because he died. That reconciled us. But then also serving as ambassadors for Christ, we are reconciled to God and we serve in the process of reconciling man to God. Now listen, let's get to verse number 21 because we wanna to get to the blessing and the privilege of being an ambassador for Christ. Verse 21 says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made 
the righteousness of God in him. So when we look at verse number 21, and we say that he who knew no sin became sin, we, we know that we're talking about the person of Jesus Christ. But there's something extremely profound going on here. See, when, when you talk about bartering, when you, when you talk about exchanging goods for goods, you know, the, 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 the basic principle of that is that you are going to exchange two things of equal value. Amen. If you're going to barter, you're not going to exchange money for goods, but you're going to exchange goods for goods. What's inherent is that you exchange something of equal value. But what we got when Jesus became sin for us, he took on our sin. And as the verse says, and it says that he gave us his righteousness. Now, listen, anybody with any business acumen will know that that's a raw deal. He gave us something that was a far greater value than what we gave him. And that's just how much he loved us. That's, that, that goes back to what we were saying earlier, that the love of Christ, it constrains us. You know, when you really understand the sacrifice that Jesus made, you understand the, 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 the level of, 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 of this love that he had for us, it ought to compel you to want to live for him. It, it ought to compel you to, to, to want to do something for him. You know, because like if somebody were in the same room as you and they're, and they're working, you're, you're compelled to work just because... Other people are working in the room. You don't want to feel lazy. You don't want to feel like this is just this bump on the log. But when you are the benefactor of the labor that's going on, you can't sit up and just let people do good for you and you not be compelled to do good for them in return. That's, that's one of the elements of being constrained by the love of God because we appreciate the sacrifice of him becoming sin. Jesus didn't have to die. Jesus was good. Je Jesus could have come to earth, lived, died, went back to heaven, no harm, no foul, because he was just. But he became sin, took on sin. And that's what we have to understand as believers. He gave us his righteousness. You know, when you think back to a parable, there, there, there's a parable that uh, Jesus taught and he talked about a wedding feast. He talked about a person who went to the wedding feast and they didn't have the proper attire. That proper attire was a robe of righteousness. And what was tragic is that because they didn't have the proper attire, it says when the groomsmen came, he removed him from the wedding. Now, what that means for us as believers is that we are given the proper attire for the wedding feast. We are given righteousness. Scripture talks about in the book of Isaiah that we are clothed in righteousness. We're given the righteousness that is needed in order for us to qualify for the wedding feast. And that's what's so precious about being an ambassador for Christ. That's what I meant by saying that there are blessings and there are privileges in being an ambassador for Christ. We receive his righteousness. You know, it's an oxymoron to think of somebody who's being quote unquote, self-righteous. Because what's inherent is that nobody's righteous. That's what Paul said. In Romans chapter three, verse 10, he says, there is none righteous. But look at what God did. God gave us his righteousness, even though we didn't deserve it. We are ambassadors for Christ because of the amazing love that God has for us. That's the lesson that we have for you today. I want to thank I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode of Just Teach. Our goal here is to simply encourage as many people as we can in the Word of God and certainly to spread the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world. We're asking you to support us in this effort by liking, by sharing, by subscribing, and certainly Leave your comments in the comment section if you have any questions around the lesson. And if you have any prayer requests, we want to pray with you. We want to stand with you. Listen, we love you with the love of the Lord. We'll see you next time.